Wavy Wreck from Warming Woes, Phantom Sock Phenomenon Perplexes Printer Person, and Burn Bits Beneath the Block Fire or Foul Residue. All this and more Print Fix Friday, episode 215. I'm on my way back from China. I hope. Let's get into it. Real quick, if you missed our live stream with FiberSeq, where we showed off the brand new FiberSeeker 3, their continuous carbon fiber machine, not this chopped filament stuff, but actual carbon monofilament embedded into your filament. We'll link to it so you guys can take a look. But starting off here with a fun one from our Discord. This is from Crazy Photon, where they were drying out some Matter Hackers nylon in their Sunlu E2, and the spool got wavy as sin. This is 90 degrees Celsius inside of the E2, which is a high temp heater for your filament. And the spool itself is made of polystyrene, a material that should handle this heat perfectly fine, but I think I know exactly what happened. And I kind of hate that it's happened to me too. I have a Sunlu S4 that while works perfectly fine, you don't really want to put spools anywhere near the exhaust of the machine. Now on the S4, that's a problem because the exhaust is basically down here at the spool and blows directly onto the spool. On the E2, it's on the edges. But what we find is that at least on the S4, so I'm gonna extrapolate a bit for the E2, is that the exhaust is significantly hotter. 40 or 50 degrees Celsius hotter than what the chamber is supposed to be at to try to get it to that optimal chamber temperature as quickly as possible. But you can damage spools, filament, and really anything that's in there that you would think would like a nice consistent chamber temperature, but if it's close to that exhaust, you might actually find that you're overheating it, and that is exactly what happened here. 90 degrees Celsius should be perfectly fine for polystyrene, and it generally is actually pretty good for nylon as well, but we can see here that there was some sort of damage. Now, this might not be pure polystyrene. This might be some sort of PS blend uh, that is a little bit more susceptible to heat, but knowing that this is a nylon roll. It's not like they re-spooled this. You can see the nylon sticker clearly on the spool itself. I would venture to say that it's the heater that is causing the problems. I don't exactly have a good solution yet for our S4, and it's why we are not currently using it. And at this time, we are pausing recommendations for the Sunlu dryers until we can really determine if this is a firmware or software kind of thing where it's just running in a different PID or bang bang loop, or if we could easily solve this with some printed parts to redirect that heat flow somewhere else or potentially relocate the thermistor that measures the chamber temperature to be a little bit more conservative, I guess, when it comes to dealing with those exhaust fumes. But I'd love to know your thoughts. How should we as consumers deal with this, especially on a dryer that's designed for engineering grade materials? This would upset me. And is there a way that we can try to either fix it or minimally hold manufacturers accountable for this kind of thing? Recently, 3D Printopia, we spoke with Ibos, and I'm really excited to see more of their products. We've been running their Tetras on our Bamboo AMS for a while now. I quite like it. It's a four bay dryer where each of the bays can have a different temperature. Just super freaking nice and if you're still like me rocking an old ams1 because if it ain't broke don't fix it this is a great way to keep four spools perfectly dry at all times even if they require four different temperatures super cool we'll link to the tetras down below and if you guys do want to see some content from ibos let us know unfortunately while they are in shenzhen which is about a two-hour plane flight away from shanghai where we will be i got a 10-year visa we can go back whenever we want so uh let me know if you guys want to see that kind of thing we keep all of our spools out in the open air because sealing every one of the spools would be cost prohibitive and time prohibitive we've thought about fully dehumidifying just that bottom area of the rack but we will likely look at doing something that is let's go with more permanent in the shop expansion that is coming soon if you are interested in learning more about what our plans are 
for the shop expansion, you can join our Discord, $10 tier and higher. And hey, if that kind of thing does excite you, my name is Grant. This is 3D Musketeers Printer Provider, where we help you get your printers back to printing with purpose. If you have an issue with your 3D printer or your 3D prints and want us to take a look at it, you could do so by hitting us up on all the social medias. Or uh, our favorite way, film a video on YouTube, tag us in the description of it. We will get a notification on it. We can actually show it here on the channel with audio and all of that. It makes diagnosing a little bit easier and a lot more fun in my opinion. Moving on, I, I, I don't want to dig too deep into this, but call me DJ Khaled because we got another one. Another one. This one specifically marked number 45. And as of filming this video, this was from two days ago. We are already at 47 of the identical issues on the Bamboo A1 and P1S with their power supply boards failing. We've got one. We can see exactly what's going on. We have a few more on the way and then we're gonna send them off to get tested by a lab. I want you all to know that if you are running a Bamboo A1 from November, 2024 or newer, please do not leave it unattended. And if you have to leave it unattended for some reason, put it on a block of concrete, put it on something that is not flammable in the freak case that it might actually not just burn itself out and, you know, not cause any further issues other than, you know, killing the board and shutting the machine off. We don't want to see a house fire. I just want you guys to know that we're still working on this. And if you do have a machine that has gone through this issue and you have one of these dead boards, please reach out to us. We will cover all costs to get it to us. We want to send a decent test size out to a testing facility so they can analyze this and give us a rundown of exactly what went wrong. And that way we have a you know, as much of a sample size we can get. You will see later on in the episode this actually kind of comes back to bite us. So stay tuned, leave a like, get subscribed. Let's move on to the next one. From awesome designer Beer, who gave us a nice little hero's journey here on the Instagrams about losing some socks. And well, Beer's name is not Dobby, so I think we're okay. Master has given Dobby a sock. Let's take a look at exactly what happened. See, uh, oh, socks gone, and the socks gone. They're inside the part. They're inside the part. But kind of lucky in that, well, be able to pull them right out. And so what's the lesson to learn from this? Set proper infill. If you are dealing with a print like this, a huge print. And the thing you don't want to see is that the socks from your hot end are gone. And you shouldn't see them because these prints from a guy beer are designed to be support free for the most part, and sometimes even completely hollow. But I guess when you scale them up to be the size of a freaking H2D, well, you can run into some scaling artifact issues where you probably could have used a little bit of infill. If you are saying, but Grant, I don't want to add a bunch of infill into my part, that's going to waste a ton of material and a ton of time. I understand. There are some options for you. The, I, I guess, naive among us might choose for the lightning infill. I personally hate lightning infill. It goes with grid infill for me. Throw them away. Yes, it is the lightest possible infill out there, but it presents so many areas for failure that it's just not worth it. If you need to use lightweight materials as much as possible, use support cubic and call it a day. It will use as minimal material as possible for the infill. And then right toward the top, it will increase its percentages to give you a good surface to build on. That way you're not bridging over air. But certainly if I came back to my H2D and I just saw that it was straight up missing the socks, I too would wonder where the heck did they end up? Hilariously, they end up in the bottom of the model. MacGyver was able to get them out, which is great. It means in theory, you could reuse them, but you're not always that lucky. And well, the socks are crazy cheap. So just buy spares, keep them in stock, replace them often. When they start to tear, it's time to replace them because when they start to tear, they lose a lot of their 
kind of hold on to the hot end itself and have a higher tendency to fall off. I've had this happen where socks have fallen off mid print and gotten embedded into the print. This was back in the day before printers had, you know, cameras and brains and smarts about them. It just printed right through the silicone sock. Didn't give a damn. I'm like, where did the sock go? And we had to like use a flashlight to find one area in the part that was really dense. And that told us that's where the silicone sock was. It still lives there to this day. We never went to retrieve it because it would have required destroying the part and it wasn't worth it to us. Moving on to a title that was sent to me and said, you should take a look at this. 250 hours in and the AD5X almost burst into flames. Got about two to 300 hours on this machine. And we can see that the user had a bit of an issue and it looks like from their perspective that the machine almost caught fire, except it didn't. It didn't even come close. When we look into the comments, we can actually see a photo that they posted of their machine that decided to go mining. As a child, I yearned for the mines. The hot end was way too close to the build plate and, uh, well, just carved its own path. So what we actually see back here on the hot end is not some sort of residue from a fire. It's the PEI powder coating that was ground up by the nozzle. And this is where I have to ask myself that all the talking about the printers, you know, bamboos, elegoos, and others that have potential fire issues, are we creating an atmosphere where now people are going directly to the fact that, oh, my printer could have caught fire without really looking at what the situation could be or do you think that this is just a case of someone not knowing what they're looking at, not knowing what is going on with the machine, and because of that, they saw thing change color, change color bad, change color must mean too hot, too hot means fire. I can certainly see myself, back in the day obviously, looking at this and saying, that's not right, it shouldn't look like that. But then when I would see this, I would think I would understand where it came from. From my perspective, this machine did not come close to catching fire. This is totally normal. That's just basic grime that gets onto the hot block area of a machine. And I guess the 85X has a similar hot end style to the A1 and now the P series and the H series where it's a very simple system to remove the nozzles. But yeah, this is, this is just PEI that was ground off by the machine and kind of thrown around the enclosure that they built for their printer. And so what's the solution here? Well, the first solution is you gotta replace the bed. Now you might get lucky, you might be able to flip it over and maybe that works perfectly fine, but chances are it won't properly level. We have to look at why the system failed to probe properly. If the AD5X works like the AD5M, which I assume it does, and given that bolt right there, tells me it probably does. They use a, a nozzle booping system where it uses a load cell to detect the bed. Now I could be wrong on this. If I am, somebody will correct me in the comments. So if you think I'm wrong or wanna make sure that I'm right, check the comments, always check the comments. The comments are often where you can find anything that I got wrong and people making fun of me. You know, we want you to comment. It's part of the fun of this, okay? But I would guess that if your nozzle went on a bit of a mining adventure that we see here, the chances are it's bent. Or minimally, it was very, very loose inside of this cage. Now this thin part of bent sheet metal worries me a little bit. That doesn't inspire confidence. And looking at this, I'm not certain that I see anything here that says, oh, you need to replace it. But definitely go ahead and heat it back up at the machine clean all of this off the thing that we recommend to clean off nozzles are copper or brass brushes for cleaning firearms they often have a longer bristle section and then a long area and then a very short and thin section of bristles so if you need to get into some detail areas on your machine you can get into it they exist you can get them on amazon and they're relatively cheap we'll link to some in the description below. But this looks okay. I might swap it out just to be certain, but if this was a little bit loose in the mount, that could cause a load cell based leveling system to fail. But if for some reason it's not a load cell based system, 
and it is a traditional, hey, you got to manually level the bed and it just remembers that. If you didn't put the build plate in properly, or even if it is a nozzle probing system and the build plate wasn't in properly and it was flexing a little bit, where the nozzle's trying to push and it wasn't triggering as fast as it should, that would cause the nozzle to go mining. Now, thankfully, build plates are cheap as chips. You can buy them from the myriad of usual individuals, including Big Tree Tech, B Cube, they're the same company. I'm sure there's tons of alphabet soup companies on Amazon that you're welcome to buy from as well. As far as I can tell, most PEI beds are gonna be pretty much the same, but certainly the Glacier or Frostbite plates from Big Tree Tech or BQ will work perfectly fine for your machine. Just make sure you follow the cleaning directions because some of them can be susceptible to damage with alcohol. That's why we always recommend to use Windex or an ammonia-based glass cleaner to clean your build plates. Keeps them nice and squeaky clean, gets rid of the oils that your dirty mitts put on the build plates and make life a little bit easier. But do you think us talking about the A1 fire issues or potential fire issues, I should say, causing people to suspect fire when in reality it's something different? I, I, I don't know. I almost feel partially responsible for this person saying that it almost burst into flames. I, I, I don't see any evidence here that tells me that this machine almost burst into flames. I see plenty of evidence that the machine dug into the build plate. That is obvious, but I don't see any evidence of a fire or anything like that. So I'd like to know. I don't know of a better way that we can bring light to issues that we believe are a concern to the consumer industry as a whole in this 3D printing, you know, community that we call an industry as well, but also not create some sort of like fear of demise or FUD or whatever the heck people claim that we are on the internet when we're not but we certainly recognize that bringing something to light and showing it means that if someone sees it and they see something that might look like it on their machine they might draw a conclusion that doesn't line up i'd love to know your thoughts i don't think ultimately that there's anything better that we could do but i'm always open to hearing your thoughts and opinions and i hope you post them down below but certainly comments that we hear all the time because we hang out with a lot of them but the names also right next to me at the five dollar tier and higher and at the ten dollar tier and higher you can come hang out with us in our private discord server links of course for all of those in the description down below but i do want to thank all of you for being with us now for 215 episodes of print fix friday and episodes that have gotten us noticed by companies like fiberseek who flew us literally halfway around the world 19 and a half hours in the air and i start my trek in literally an hour and a half basically and that is both scary and amazing at the same time so thank you all for making this kind of thing possible. And I hope you enjoy how we bring you all along as well. And if there's anything that you all would like to see more from us, if it's behind the scenes content or whatever you have, any thoughts or ways that we could make better content for you, let us know in those comments. That is all we have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.